Good evening, everyone, this Sunday evening, and welcome to this latest uh, iteration of uh, the Indica Books uh, Writers Open House with Otis. You, I think I don't see any new uh, name or face here, so you know, you all know the drill. Uh, without further ado, we can get started. Uh, just by way of uh, housekeeping, we will uh, not have a session on the 10th of October, that is next Sunday. And most likely, we will not have a session on the 17th of October either because uh, uh, I'll be traveling and be unavailable. But I'll try and see if we can have one on the 17th, but we're definitely not having one on the 10th. Uh, Otis, how many pieces do you have with that for us? Um, well, I've, with the group that we have here, I have... Someone can tell me if I have this wrong, but Rohini has a piece up and Aditi, I think we have a piece up. Um, and I think Jay's piece was also pending from Jay last said, time, if I, if I remember. He's not right. here yet. He resubmitted something. So um, I have okay. one, two, three, four. Um, I think I have four. So, okay. Um, and uh, and DT, I think that we didn't do your piece last week. Is that right, or did we? Um, That's right. <laughs> okay. I, I uh, Aditi, we, we, uh, we're doing that anthology, and actually, I was reading the the piece for the anthology, and I was like, wait a second, I've read this piece already, and then I actually <laughs> see when I go to my notes here that I read a small oh. section of it. Um, in in this writer's open house and i i'm terrible often with faces and names but i usually don't forget stories it's funny um so okay um well then let's uh let's start with your work uh adt um let's see i'm going to share my screen host is going to enable my sharing <clears throat> uh host Is it good? Okay. Here we go. Yes. Okay. Uh, let's see. Let me get rid of this. Okay. So you see that now. Let's get rid of that. Clean up this area. Okay. Um, so I. Um, On the downside, I should have been good and sort of reviewed this piece a little bit. Aditi, maybe you could tell us a little bit what you're what you're doing here in this work, and then we can get into it. Sure. So this is a continuation of um, a story I started on on Indra, the the king of the the devas or, or, or the gods, and like an, and um, what's happening in in this scene is in the in the earlier scene, he had heard what he thought was a, a call to to battle and he's um, now answering that and he's on the way to uh, the, the scene of a, a the scene of this, this battle and then the, the background of it is that he's been kind of going through this crisis where he feels like he's not relevant or important in the the pantheon of the of the devas anymore so that's that's kind of the the, the background and then in this piece there's really more this is like a first try at just imagining out what may be happening. So it's it's pretty it's pretty rough. What I was really trying to do is focus on imagining what this this world looks like and setting up that 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 scene for uh, the battle, which will come next. Okay. Um, well, maybe you can read a small section of it for us. Um, let's start. Uh, do you see my big my picture here? So mm -hmm. let's start here. And uh, I actually. Uh, I'll have you read down to here. So I'll have to move it. You can either read your copy or, or my copy. I'll have to move it so that okay. we can continue to see while you read. <laughs> okay. Indra could tell from the faint fluttering of wings that he heard in the distance and the way Ayurveda's bunched muscles released underneath him. 
from the change in the winds that his younger brother was approaching. He felt that same confusing mix of affection and annoyance that he always experienced around Denarion. Moments later, the massive beating wings of Garuda, the eagle Vahana of his brother, came into view. Involuntarily, Indra flinched as he usually did around that majestic bird whom he had been unable to defeat in battle. Garuda had humiliated him that day long ago when Indra had hurled his Vajra thunderbolt weapon at him, made from the bones of Dadichi, the great Rishi. Garuda had not been the least bit injured and instead arrogantly proclaimed that he would shed one feather from his body in honor of the Rishi. Indra had bristled from the insult, but had never spoken or acted against him again. One, because he was now his brother's companion and to oppose him was to oppose Narayana, and two, because he was not quite sure he could actually defeat him. Astride, astride the back of the golden Garuda. Uh, I'm sorry, I did something screwy. <laughs> I, I did something screwy. How, how about that? <laughs> yep, that okay. works. Astride the back of the golden Garuda rode Narayana, sky blue against the black space, four arms holding aloft a mace, a conch shell, the whirring serrated golden discus of the Sudarshana chakra and a lotus flower. Narayana smiled as he met Indra's eyes, his, eye, his white teeth gleaming brighter than the nearby moons, and he signaled Garuda to take him next to Indra. Narayana slipped, slapped Indra's armored shoulder and laughed, brother, it has been a while. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, thank you. I, I, uh, I'm recalling this. I, I noted at the end that uh, that I, I like this sort of real interaction. It feels like. I mean, I think that this, the situation with gods and their sort of metaphysical aspects. That's that's very hard for. It's hard for human beings to sort of interact with that because it's not like us. You know, one of the fundamental things it seems to me with writing is that the reader identifies with the characters that they're reading about and they see them as being like themselves. That aspect has, through writing actually has become more and more pronounced, I think, through history in a sense. You know, at first it was like kings and heroes and these people who seemed to be very elevated and it was stories of elevated people for sort of like, for the enjoyment of the peasantry, you know, kind of. Um, and maybe we still have that a little bit today with our, you know, our sort of Hollywood idolatry and all of that stuff. Um, but as time has gone on, we've sort of brought these levels together so that people really identify with the struggles of the central character as their own. And I think that that's basically the challenge of this piece, right? Um, to be able to write about Indra in a way that any human being is going to be able to identify with those struggles and participate with them, right? I mean, this is the thing I say all the time, right? We want to create a protagonist that goes on a, an emotional journey of some kind, and we basically use them as a vehicle for the reader to go on the same emotional journey um, in verisimilitude. And also with that sort of important aspect of like, they're going along on the journey, they are involved because they feel a resonance with the character, but they also objectify the character too, so they feel safe. I mean, those are both of those are just as important, not just identification, because the reader doesn't want to feel actually stressed. The reader wants to feel as if they're sitting around the fire, just like the olden days, you know, listening to the story unfold. So that's the big challenge. And I think uh, in this, piece you're developing this nice very human interaction between these two brothers and uh i feel that it's working really nicely and and in this sort of you're also handling this sort of magical you know realm i i have i'm personally having trouble you know maybe seeing how these uh these large birds and animals and elephants are interacting on a plane because it's a non-material plane as far as I can understand. So I'm, I am having a little trouble with that. Those might be things that you're more familiar with. Um, it does occur to me, you know, it's like, uh, 
I, I don't know, it might even be like, you know, you're familiar with like comics or cartoons or some kinds of imagery that you're familiar with that I'm simply not familiar with, right? There's imagery that you have, you know, culturally that I just don't have. Um, whereas if, if there were images, cultural images that were common to me, I would be able to evoke those more easily for people who are familiar with that culture. So, um, so the, the, um, the animals themselves are very much part of the cultural motif. Um, what I did do is like the, the planet where they go to to have this battle, like I actually researched just like online. So that's actually like a real um, like planet that like the astronomers have like have looked at. And, and so that part I tried to take from like real research, but um, like that, that actually exists. But yeah, it, it, it's hard um, integrating or, or meshing the two. Right, right. So that's going to continue to be the struggle. So I mean, have fun with it. And uh, I think that I'm not positive, you know, really how to approach it. I mean, I think it's true of sort of like these dreamscapes or hallucinatory scape, you know, scapes that we sometimes make in writing or, you know, that I have. I think the the thing that ends up working is it's just my guess, right? But to keep focusing on very concrete language. So like when we finally break it down, we could say all these things about the story and all these things and like, oh, it's complex and cultural, et cetera, et cetera. But when it comes down to it, what we're dealing with are words. And there are certain words that basically trigger responses in the reader better than other words. I mean, I think that that's just the case. You know, and and yes, some of that is you know cultural. If if I write the word apple and you've never seen an apple, that doesn't do much for you. But there are a lot of words that we have in common. And then there's also not just the um, not just the word itself, but also the rhythm and music of the language that also plays a role because the music, what we hear basically in our head silently as we read words and as we deal with the rhythms and the rhythms of the language, that's a real thing too. So those two things, concrete words and the rhythm of the language, the music of the language are very tangible things. And so just lean into that as much as you can. Uh, beware of abstract words, beware of collective nouns. We don't see collective nouns as well as we see uh, specific identified words, you know, we don't, if you close your eyes, and I say, the crowd rushed the fence. You don't really see anything because you can't see the word crowd. We can't see these collectives. It's just limitations of our brains. So I would just lean heavily with that. Um, I do recall, I don't recall exactly what the plotting is. But I wasn't following very concrete. I wasn't following very exactly the necessity of things. Uh, why certain things had to take place, you know, that basically that narrative logic. So that should be very clear. I mean, particularly yeah. if you have a realm in which some other things might not be exactly clear, though that sort right. of line of argument should be exactly clear. Yeah, I think I still have to clarify that in my head, some of the, the rules <laughs> of the world. Yes. Oh, funny. It's, it's funny that when we don't have things clarified in our head, they also don't come out on the page in a clarified way. But but this is also absolutely OK. I mean, I'm going to I mean, truth. The truth is I don't have things clarified in my head either as I'm writing them. They become more and more clarified as time goes on. And I think anything that we write, the, my, the most successful things that I've written, I don't even feel like I've written them because there's no way that I could have written them in a single, you know, I don't have the capacity to do it. What we do is we write something. What are, it's like making uh, Damascus steel, you know, Damascus steel, that gorgeous steel that sort of, you know, they layer it and layer it and layer it. And you'd be like, you might say, how can you make that Damascus blade? That's amazing. It's like, I don't. I just come back day after day after day and I layer it again and I polish it again and I layer it again and I polish it again. Right. And it's the same with our writing. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I, I think I, the other 
the other issues, like I'm still, I, I tend to like very long beginnings, but the majority of the story actually does take place on on Earth. And like he, when he goes through this, this trial that he agrees to go through where he takes like a human form. So that part should be more like concrete and relatable, but we just haven't gotten, we haven't gotten there yet. Right, right, right. And, uh, and I, I, for me, you know, coming from my culture, I really, I do really enjoy the polytheistic, you know, like the multi gods and, and all of them have having personalities, you know, that are sort of distinct and very, you know, very knowable. So like, I think the more you do that, as you're already doing it here, the better. Um, that's, you know, from my point of view, it's really enjoyable to read these characters that are very very human in their manifestation. And it's not like the Judeo-Christian God that I'm used to that's, I don't know what what it is, you know, just like a, a stern bearded white guy in a chair judging everybody. <laughs> I don't like it, I don't like it. Um, uh, the, I just noted this little thing. So I'm not really sure so he has the, I know old friend Indra said, I feel it too. Something did not feel right. There was a tingling in the back of his neck, a, a frisson of unease. It's just been a while since we fought, he thought to himself. It's just that feeling of being a little rusty. So I think this is a place where I'm not, maybe you're also haven't exactly identified how Obviously, it's like a kind of world construction issue, you know, um, I don't know what it means to fight. I don't know if it's a metaphysical fight or if it's a physical fight. And actually, when I read this part, I, I knew that we were going to the world. So I didn't know if he's being called down to the world to engage in. I, I guess I think of things as being maybe abstracted and metaphysical versus being physical and, and, you know, in the material universe. And, and I, that translation between the two, I guess I'm just still having a little bit of trouble with. I, do you have a- Yeah, it's, it's, it's meant to be physical. So like there is That's actual- That's meant to be physical. Yeah. So like the I actual think, role uh, of Indra is to fight like the, the asuras or, or, the, or the demons. And what's happening is right now, there haven't been that many like asuras for him to fight. So he feels less and less important and now it seems like there's going to be a a new battle so if indra becomes physical will he feel physical pain yeah and this is where it starts to get to get like to get tricky but but yes and and is it possible for him to go into the physical world and basically you know as like like a, a person might be killed person is killed then they return to the spiritual plane so he might be forever lasting but if he comes into the world and he actually experiences pain or makes mistakes or he can yes. be forced back into the spiritual world in which case he's failed in the material world is that is that safe yeah that, 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 that's right and what actually happens in his case when he goes to the material world he's he's kind of made a a bet <laughs> where if he wins or loses he just dis he could just disappear entirely so he wouldn't return to a spiritual realm. He'd, he'd just be gone mm. from, from the pantheon as, as, as a whole. Okay. So this might be a place, you know, it's, it, it's just been a while since I've engaged in material struggle. This might be a place for you just to dig into some of these mm. things so that we can really understand how it works. Um, because when thought is kind of a vague notion, and I don't know how, you know, a god fights they again it goes back to essentially skin in the game right do they right. have anything at stake can they lose anything and so mm -hmm. you making it clear that there is a kind of actual material transition for the character and then there's something to lose that that would be an important aspect so then it makes us then it basically makes us wonder what's going to happen as opposed to an enduring um deity that that, that can't suffer essentially um and i think that 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 issue of disappearance should be leaned into also it's funny i was just writing about disappearance in in my own work but like isn't that really the greatest tragedy right i mean it's not i mean it isn't death you, you know everyone dies but some people die 
and they're gone. I mean, that's also, you know, that's sort of embedded in sort of like the reverence mm -hmm. for the ancestors and, and telling the stories and all of that stuff, all very important things to me, you know, so that that sense of really being disappeared and not even being remembered that you should lean into that too, I think. So that hasn't, like that, that part of it hasn't come yet. So like, yeah, and that's kind of the, the, the issues. So in, in this fight scene are the, the typical when you have like a devas and asuras, there are stakes that can go on for like millions of years you can it, things happen but you wouldn't like it, indra has never like died or indra hasn't disappeared but what is, ends up happening here in the next scene he feels like very humiliated when he like at the, at the end of that at, at the end of the battle and then he says i don't want to live like this anymore and then basically what he wants to do is just disappear entirely and then he and his brother get into this battle which i haven't quite figured out the exact um, terms of it, but that's what then sends him into Earth as an actual human being, where he would then go through like fully human human things. But that's kind of where the stakes come in of just disappearing entirely. Mm, okay, um, I'm. I don't know how you're going to present it, but it I, it does occur to me, sort of in terms of the narrative logic, that. If, if he's going to have a stake, it would be to not disappear, not to disappear. Right. I mean, if he's he doesn't he doesn't want to get involved in order to disappear. I would have to, you know, just try and reason that out a little bit. Exactly. You know, we. We're 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 held no matter what we write, we're held to narrative logic, which is basically, you know, our common understanding of sort of how people work in their psychology and to create this sense of stakes basically in the story so <clears throat> we want our character to want something um you know I, I often tell the wallet story you know like you know and the, you know i go to the restaurant i i'm looking for my wallet i go to the restaurant i get my wallet that's not a story but it's also not a story to be like i don't want my wallet that's also not a story. So, you know, so, I lost my wallet, but I don't care. <laughs> you know, it's like, so. Well, um, well the, the idea was that he just has to kind of skate by and not get involved. And if he can do that, then he can disappear. But then the challenge for him is like the world is going through a lot of trouble and it's hard for him not to, not to Didi, care, not to Didi, get involved. You're using, you're using the one word that I, that, that is like, I don't know. I, I do not believe in bad words, you know, just bad people. No, I'm kidding about that. I, that's a joke. But the, the one word that rackles me more than any other, this word called idea. <laughs> the yeah. idea. Um, William Carlos Williams said, no ideas, but in things which actually is an idea. So we can work that out <laughs> over time, <laughs> but um, okay. I, well, I'm excited and I, I like the way this is developing. And I definitely, I, I love that moment with the two brothers. This is uh, one of the keys for all of us. Really, if we want, we want to have complex emotions. And it seems to me at one point I reasoned out complexity basically means having two things. Instead of just one thing, I hated my brother, right? That's not complex. Complexity is I hated my brother, but I also needed him, right? That becomes a complexity. Three things is confusing, mm -hmm. you know, probably. Four things confusing, five things confusing. One thing, boring. Boring, confusing, two things, complex. Necessary complexity. And I like that you have a confusing mix and you do a nice job here. You're not, you don't, just have him be confused about his brother, you identify him as being confused between these two things. So we get to witness that. That's also well done. Affection and annoyance. Um, that sounds like an older brother with a younger brother. It's not the way I felt about my older brother. Okay, uh, thank you. Let's, uh, um, uh, great work, I enjoyed it. Thanks, and... Otis. Let's see. Uh, Rohini. 
Yeah. I'm here. Hi, Hi how are you? Fine, thank you. How are you? Oh, good. It's been way too long since I've read your work. <laughs> it takes me a very long time to write it and rewrite it and rewrite it. Oh, I know your I've style. I've been working you're, on it. You're a jeweler is the thing. I have I have friends. There, there, there are those of us who write, we're sort of like, we basically write like a machine gun. You know, that's how our, that's our style. And then there are people who write like jewelers. It's another style. I, I don't have that style. Um, well, uh, tell us a little bit about what's happening. It, it's just different. Everyone's okay, different. This is yeah. <laughs> It's, it's the beginning of a novel. It starts with this sage who is at the end of his life, but he has not fulfilled his obligation, which is to pass on his knowledge. And on the last day of his life, he sees this young boy coming up the mountain. He sees he's in a place where there's nobody else. He's very high up on the mountain. And he sees this very young boy coming up the mountain. And as the story goes on, this is the boy he was supposed to pass the knowledge on to. And this is also the hero of the book. So that's mm. that's the basic story. It's, the, it's, the it's based reminds... on the Mahabharata. Yeah. Um, well, I love, I love the tone right now. It reminds me, I can't remember the writer, but um, there was a writer, he wrote a book, it's well known, called The Prophet. I think it's called The Prophet. Um, phew, I should look. Gibran? Khalil Gibran. Oh, no, 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 not not Gibran. No, no, no. It's a mm. it's a modern a modern novel. Mm. Oh, a, a Cholo. Um, ah, Paul Cholo. Yeah, Paul yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I I read that. I did not think I was going to get involved in that, but I but I I love that book. You know, it it worked continually on the level of being so clear and both seeming so real as if it were actually attached to a real place but but also a little bit ethereal and um and this the style here reminds me a little bit of it and i read it with i read it with the same ease so that's definitely all of those things are and and i see that you're setting up in this something that's going to that's i mean this adventure that's going to take place i mean this is the sort of you know the the so this figure is coming up the mountain pass um and uh I, rohini i the only the only issue uh yeah well let's go back to talking about being a jeweler the only issue is to make sure that you're getting enough time to write and you're not getting in your own way yeah this is <laughs> that's very important yes <laughs> i um, already have the first draft i finished the first draft of uh, three books that was written a long time ago i'm polishing okay so there so what if you're going back through this book and it, maybe that's why you're bringing it here what i would so there's just like little things even though yes. you're writing it right now with really a light touch, we would yeah. describe, right? Your, you, your sentences are, are not exactly exact. You know, I don't feel that sort of sense of, some people write with a sort of maximal style where they, you know, really are delving into all of these specifics and you're really writing with a light touch. Yeah. But I think one of the, one of the things that the, um, who's it, Paul, Paul Cholo? Anyway. Yeah. One of the things that he does is that he is he is actually very attached to a material world. It is not finally abstract, even though it feels very much like a philosophical journey. It also seems to be tied every now and then with very exact material descriptions of things, even though they're even though they're not necessarily terribly specific, they're very accurate. And so taking care of that, I think would be important here. And the place where I actually, I, I, I felt it right away, when the dawn light brightened, the old sage saw a small figure far away, climbing steadily up the side of the mountain. So 
Rohini, this is a place where I go like, okay, if I'm on a mountain, right? Like, I, where am I really? Like, where am I really as a, as a physical person? I'm sitting here, blah, blah, blah. How do I see somebody coming up the mountain? How do I do it from very far away? Like, am I seeing them on an opposite mountain? Am I seeing them coming up this uh, upper ravine? You know, am I seeing them here and then they disappear and then maybe an hour would go by and then I would see them here, right? Yeah. How does it actually happen? Yeah. I, I would and, make that and making, yeah. yeah, so making sure, so not just like in our mind because we can write anything. Oh, I saw yes. him coming up the mountain. It's like, oh, that's fine. I can type it, type away. Yes. But it doesn't mean that it's actually something that's associated with real material events. Yes. <clears throat> right. So one. Um, <clears throat> so I think a lot about that kind of stuff. Like I think a lot about basically the the balance of I can write anything. I cannot just write anything. I have to write things that are going to evoke a sense of yes. reality in my reader's mind. So it's just a tiny thing. Um, you you do it nicely when you get to these details of the flowers, right? And you actually do it fairly nicely when I understand that there's sort of a meadow. Maybe there's a, but again, you don't want it to be just idealized in your mind where the rules of physics don't apply. Yeah. We want to make sure that we have the rules of physics. That means we have various sight lines. We don't see around corners. We don't, you know, hear, you know, we don't see things that are behind our back, uh, et cetera. We can't see through mountains. Yeah. Um, okay. But that's, there's that, and then, uh, oh, let, but let me have you re just read a little bit. Here, could you read maybe, um, yeah, just read this beginning part for us. When the dawn light brightened, the old sage saw that a small figure far away climbing steadily up the side of the mountain. He frowned. It was still too early for people. The first to come were usually the shepherd boys scouting for summer grazing. That would not be for weeks. The Bogyals, the vast high mountain meadows, which stretched out in front of his small hut, were still covered in snow. He had not thought he would see another human because he had not expected to live this long. This year, he would not see the green of spring or watch the wild flowers explode would not see the Brahma Kamal bloom, sending up its delicate papery cones, which shone like pale and ghostly lanterns in the night. Nor would he see the blue puppies shake free of prickly sheets and spread their sky blue petals to the fleeting sun. He would be long gone by then. Oh no, That had been the bit. plan. Read a little. That yes, had been the plan. He had bowed to the mountains last night, thanking them for encircling his lonely hut and keeping him company all these years. And he had lingered late, storing up that last sight. Then he tidied up his few belongings and lay down on the mattress with a last prayer to make the final crossing in his sleep. But he had woken up this morning, as usual, and sat on his top step watching the mists clear and the great peaks emerge, burnished with sunrise gold. In the distance, range after range shimmered into sight, seeming to hang in the air, visible only for a few minutes. As the sun rose, it would disappear again. He had been granted one more glimpse of them, and he wondered why. He had finished Beautiful. his life's task, oh. though not in the way he wanted. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Ro thank you, Rohini. That's it's it's beautiful. It's beautiful. So what are we what are we doing now to work on getting this published? I, a long way to go. I still have to rewrite the whole thing. So it's the second draft is going to take me ages. 
But yeah, I hope to get a publisher um, after that. Don't don't our don't our friends here in Indica don't they have a publishing house? Yeah, they do. I'll probably approach them after I'm done. Uh, it's going to take another six months at least because it's two hundred thousand words. This first book. It's a very, it's a very long. Book. The whole thing is five hundred thousand words. First Ro draft. Rohini, Rohini, we have to move a little bit faster. I mean, this is really great work, so we have to work on getting it out there. Why don't we okay, why don't we work you. it out with Indica? Why don't you why don't you go ahead? We'll 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 draw them in. You can draw me in as an editor. We'll work together and we'll get this book done. Okay? Oh wow, superb. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I I uh I I love it. I love that that Cholo. Uh, this has that same you know, there's little things to do. But you're obviously your construction is good. You're basically creating the beginning of this journey that's going to take place. And I, I'm going to yes. hope that it is a journey that actually takes place and not not just be isolated and be in a mental journey. Um, it's not but, mental at all. It's very, very practical. I, I also I, don't like abstract. So it's very I, clear. I, and then... I, I know your style. I know you have a very physical style of writing. Uh, I know it's from your warrior training. So I, yes, I know, I know how you write. Oh, I love this piece. I, there, I'll only give you, I'll give you this comment. So one thing to think about is um, basically, if you look at the book as a whole, how you create a flow with the book. And basically what we yep. want is we want it to continue to cascade down, you know, always. We just want it to keep rolling. When you um, just, I'm, I'm pointing out this section. So I am with you right now. The person's walking up and he's doing things. I want him to continue doing things. Maybe he makes his tea. Maybe he does this, you know, deal with those material things that he does. How does he make his tea? How does he live? What is, you know, he's yeah. stored some nuts, you know, or something. He, if it's the coming yeah. of spring now, his provisions would be very low. He'd probably, yes. you know, he might be, he's familiar with cold. I like that. Um, I, do you know the Himalayas very well? Reasonably well. I used to go mountaineering. Oh my goodness, Rohini, when are we going to go mountaineering in the Himalayas together? This is what I want to do. <laughs> Okay. Yes, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. Oh, stop. Stop. I don't want to know. I don't want to know. I want to go there. Absolutely. Anyway. Anytime. Okay. This is good. I have registered that. It is happening. Oh my God. Um, I want to go. I want to go to this very hut. I want to see this hut. Um, so here you. <clears throat> We have the story going on, but then you had the sage had deliberately chosen this remote settle, uh, this yeah. remote place to settle. So when you say the sage had, when you start using language yeah. like that, you basically yeah. have a narrator coming in and stopping the momentum that we have. Yes. We have this person yes. walking up. We're involved with that. We have this character who's like, why have I not passed away in my sleep? Why am yes. I not done? Yeah. We're getting the story. It's progressing. Yes. But now you're telling us about something. It stops that momentum. So this yes. is already it's it's already moving slowly, but I'm fine with it because I think it's moving. But when you come in and start explaining things to me. Yes, I need right? to rewrite that. I will. Yes. Well, it's just, you know, obviously just make the just you know, create the reality. So like I'm saying, like, rather than tell me he yes. forged, the, you know, like you're explaining it to me how it's done. Instead, have him go inside, have him make his tea. What does he use for fuel? You know, what, yes. you know, how does he start yes. his fire? Um, yes. What, what, what does he keep his grains in? Does he have probably he has mice that would come and eat the things that he's stored if he didn't prevent the mice from having it? Perhaps he eats some of it and he gives some to the mice. I don't know. Yes, just I, I, just I will add all this. Yes. I have lots of details. Right. Yeah, but no, no I don't want to. I do not want you to go any slower. Okay, yes. but just, but but in the idea of you just 
basically what what's happening what happens here and it's sort of like the person walking up the mountain path you had the idea right and you wrote the words what you have to do instead is you have to have the idea then you have to transfer it to the material reality and write yes. the material reality yes you know and show that to us so that we understand we let the reader have ideas let the reader have feelings that's our job your job is to put the material universe onto the page that we basically follow sentence to sentence yes. and we don't stop yes absolutely uh, it's, it's beautiful work it's well constructed i am waiting either either one of two things must happen either i must go to this place because this book is published or i must go to this place so. <laughs> it's lovely it's lovely that would be worth it it's actually a historic place which i'm talking about <laughs> you're kidding me stop no, it stop, yes. stop. I, tell me no more i cannot take it um well, let's let's work this out. I think uh, I think we really we got to get you to the point of, you know, um, working towards publishing this work. I think that the work that needs to be done here is essentially editorial. I, I don't see yeah. this as it's nothing more than editorial. You have the story ready. Um, yeah. I think that if it's uh, like I say, it's editorial. You need someone you need an editor to go through, just make some marks, do the stuff that's marked. You know, no, I'm read it through again. It needs a lot of rewriting. It's not holding together. There are parts I don't... which I need to rewrite the whole. So <clears> yeah, <throat> some parts of oh. it are done, but a lot of in between. Yeah, Rohini, I see that we're having an argument here. Every time I say it's just this little bit needs to be done, then you say it needs a lot. Okay, I'm saying it needs a little. Yes. You're saying it needs a lot. This is where we don't agree. Quick. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, what do they? All right. This is the other thing about the cholo, you know, and if you know mountaineering, you know that there's two styles of mountaineering, right? There's yes. a style in which and there's a style in which we bring up all these bags with us, you know, and all the camps and all of that. And then there's the other style, which is called yeah, light yes. and fast, yeah. light and fast. I would keep this on the light and fast track. Okay, I'll I'll do the work on that. Yes, yes. Maybe there's less work than I thought. I'll suddenly. You you know what the biggest you know what the, a writer's largest obstacle is to their writing? Perfectionism. Yes, I know. <laughs> well, and another way to say that is themselves. Yes, totally, totally. Okay, good. Okay, let's talk about the next piece. And that, I love this. I love Thank this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jay. Hi, Chris. Hey, how are you? Good. How are you? I'm. I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Is, uh, um, well, let's talk a little bit about this piece. Um, okay. What, uh, um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about what you have going on here and, um, and then uh, I'll have you read a little bit and then we'll, we'll talk about it. Okay, so this is a continuation of the piece I had uh, shared a couple of weeks ago. So uh, the person who had climbed up to his apartment and seen an L, Seen a, seen a wedding invitation to his uh, to the person he's still in love with, but uh, they've broken up from the other side. So he sees a wedding invitation with her name on it. And uh, so he is contemplating suicide from his 36th floor apartment. So uh, after that, this part starts where he uh, receives a visit from a couple of police officers, one of whom is a friend of a friend. And uh, then he gets a call from one of his old friends who wants him to come back home right away with this police officer. Right, right, right. Okay. Um, maybe you can, uh, let's, let's have you read this uh, first page for us. Uh... 
from the beginning? Maybe just, maybe just, just to hear. Yeah, from the beginning. Uh, Rajan stood on the balcony of his apartment. He looked at the envelope in his hand. Gusts of wind slipped over his smooth bald head, triggering goosebumps. He looked down at the manicured lawns of his residential complex. The centerpiece was a water fountain with landscaped pathways crisscrossing around it. He watched as a ball hopped from one side of the fountain, drenched itself in the water and hopped across to the other side. Oh, there you go. Come, let's get it. A young father picked up his daughter and ran around the fountain to pick up the ball. When he returned, his wife took the child from him, leaving him with the ball and a confused look on his face. Hmm. Rajan's smile turned into a grimace. To him, the ground 36 floors below appeared closer than the possibilities that had never come to pass in his life. His fingers clasped the, uh, clasped the envelope tighter, crumpling its edges. The doorbell rang. Who could it be, he thought scanning the ground below until he spotted the custom-painted orange motorcycle of the delivery company. The doorbell rang again. Must be the rape in sunglasses. Ah, oh, well, he shrugged. If I'm going, might as well depart in style. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jay. Um, so, um, in, there's a couple of things I want to talk about in this opening. And um, in the story, generally, I guess that, you know, like whatever's going on here is kind of complicated. It's the main thing I'm getting is like, like there's, you know, there's someone's getting married and then we have someone else getting married and he's got to go back to town. And I have to admit that I feel like I'm not a hundred percent confident it's all going to work out, Jay. And you know, like, like which it's, it's not, I'm, which is a way to say like, do do I really truly feel like you have a handle on the complexity that is coming? And I'm like, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, I have I have doubts. I have doubts. Um, but on the other hand, a little part of me is like, maybe he does know what the heck is going to happen. I do know I don't know. And it's it's OK. You know, it's OK if you deliver. You have to be able to deliver. If it turns into some cockamamie mess, like going on down the line, I'm going to be pretty disappointed. Okay. The the uh, uh, Rohini's work is not a bad, you know, parallel. It's like her opening and the problem of the opening is very simple. Like I get it right away. Yours is like complicated. There's like maybe there's Ray there's Ray Bans coming, but then it's a police officer. It's uh. There's a marriage here, but now there's another marriage. There's a police officer who's a police officer, but then it's actually, he's a friend of the person who calls. I'm like, do, 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 I'm being, you know, I'm being ripped apart. That's, that was funny. I'm being, uh, you know, I, yeah. I worry, but okay. I'm going to, you know, I, I want you to go, go for it. You know, let's see what the heck happens. I don't know what's right. going to happen, you know? So, so keep yeah. going. I, I definitely feel like there's, in, there's some kind of intrigue. You're just going to have to make sure that you deliver on it. That's sure. It. Sure. I mean, if it's complexity just for the sake of like, you know, you know, basically tearing your reader apart, uh, it's not going to go over so well. Understood. You know, we find out that it's like, you do not want to trick your reader. So this is one thing that I believe very strongly about. Writing is not a trick. It's a gift, right, that we give our reader. We don't trick them. We make it clear what is happening. And you're basically, you're kind of doing that, except for I'm a, like, a lot is happening. It's clear what is happening. The reader continues to read, so they find out what's going to happen next. It is true that I do not know what's going to happen next but it has to make logical sense it has to have a, a logical narrative right now it can seem a little bit like you're you know the phrase you know like pounding you know round pegs into square holes it feels mm -hmm. a little bit like you're doing that you know like you're forcing it a little bit mm -hmm. um it doesn't feel exactly natural but um i believe in you so we'll see and so does <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay. 
in this beginning, there's a, okay, so we're going to get real highbrow. You know, I know you're writing something. It's, it feels like a crime drama of some kind, you know, uh, I don't know if it's a love story or a crime drama, but um, you do something that's called an objective correlative. This is really important. And I want everyone that all, all of us to lean on it heavily. Objective correlative is a idea that was developed by T.S. Eliot, fancy pants poet. T.S. Eliot developed this in an essay that he wrote called Tradition and the Individual Talent. Don't you don't have to read it. If you read it, you're never going to want to read things like that again, probably. But it's still a very important idea. He was obviously a poet. And what objective correlative means is that you want an object that correlates to the emotion that you want the reader to feel. So you basically use objects to make readers feel. You don't tell them what to feel and you don't say what the characters feel. So my my classic uh, explanation of this is that I think this is, I think I'm stealing this from Saving Private Ryan. You know, you have the you have the character at the graveyard, you know, standing over, you know, the grave of this, you know, person. And we've just seen the entire story and everything that's happened, you know, and um, and someone is standing next to him is like, did you know him? And uh, the soldier is staying there. He looks this way and then in the distance, you see trees going like this. He looks back and he says, yeah. Right. So the trees. That's the objective correlative. That's the object that correlates to the emotion. It's not articulated and you actually do it right here. So feel fancy. Yeah, Ram. Uh, so this sounds a lot like symbolism. Well, it's not symbolism because a symbol is a made thing. It seems to me I, I we don't have to. It's nomenclature. So a little bit it's like that. But really, you're talking about something that's imagistic. It's not a symbol, right? Okay. So a symbol is something that's already basically designed that has a cultural meaning of some kind or we make something symbolic right so the you know we we have the the person they've tended to the teacup they've cared for the teacup the teacup becomes a symbol of i'm not really into symbols actually i think we should not deal in symbols right, right, because absolutely. symbols are basically made things that we make uh objective correlatives are things instead they're imagistic moments objects so it's not exactly an object right it's the trees waving right that's an image it's not a tree <laughs> you know um if if it were a tree that would be a symbol if it were static uh, it seems to me a symbol is static but an objective correlative is imagistic maybe it's who knows peas and carrots ram i i don't know um but okay but let's look at it right uh, here yeah let let's look at it right here so he looked down at the manicure so the guy is standing up on the on the parapet <laughs> parapet he's standing up on the balcony and uh uh he's gotten the letter you know his his uh, you know his loved one is uh you know gonna marry someone else and he's standing out there he's contemplating suicide jay i think you do probably have to have a deeper understanding of sort of the suicidal tendency i think it's a little we we have to be careful with our character for for me characters are very real and so we have to treat them with this really as writers we have to treat all our characters with this kind of reverence for their humanity so we can't just have someone be suicidal because we want them to be because we want to put them up on a ledge. This is what I think. This is not what Hollywood thinks. So I'm not trying to say that I am agreeing with every storyteller, but it is what I think. So suicide and suicidal feelings are, you know, derived from, I mean, that, that's something to probe and to try and understand. They're not usually triggered by being jilted. But anyway, but anyway, he looked down, he's standing up there, he's looking down, 
the centerpiece was a water fountain with landscape pathways. Crisscross was a little unclear around it. He watched as a ball hopped from one side of the fountain, um, you know, skipped over the water and uh, rolled into the lawn. I would probably, for a little greater clarity. Oh, there you go. Come, let's get it. A father picked up his daughter and ran around the fountain to pick up the ball. When he returned, his wife took the child from him, leaving him with the ball. Okay, cut this. We don't. Hi. This is not the point, but this is basically an objective correlative, right? So, Ram, does that make any sense? This is an image that he sees that corresponds to the emotion that he has. And this is, it's, it's actually a very sophisticated way to start thinking about our writing. The character, when we're dealing with character point of view, the things that they see convey also their interiority. Does that make sense? So like, mm -hmm. it's a little bit complicated, maybe even a little bit mystical, okay? T.S. Eliot, you know, with his objective correlative, my guy standing at the graveyard, he looks off, he sees the waving trees, right? It's an object, but it correlates to the emotion that he has inside. What he sees in his point of view also reveals who he is. So, so I have a doubt. So let us say that a character has a, has a lot of internal turmoil. There is a lot of confusion in his mind. And then he sees a dust cloud swirling and a lot of like, you know, bits and pieces of dirt swirling in it. Would that be objective correlated? Sure. I think so. Okay. I think so. Right. And I... So, so, so basically the difference between well, a symbolism and objective correlative is it's, it's very concrete imagery. Concrete image, imagery. Um, sure, but I mean, my 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 sense of symbol is symbol is again. I go back to symbol is a made thing. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's not an organic thing. You know, I guess with the objective correlative, I'm thinking of something that's organic. You know, to the the person, it, and and as a principle again. What, what a point of view character sees basically is also telling them what's salient, right? To them, to their psychology. So, you know, when we are in the character's point of view, he looks away, he sees the trees. That means that those trees waving like that have a kind of salience because he could look away basically and see nothing, right? He could perceive no detail in the horizon. He could look at the blue sky. We don't know. But what he sees is the trees waving, right? So that creates a kind of sense of salience, if you want to be psychological about it, that then is also revealing of his character. But what's revealing of his character, while we participate with it, also makes us feel, right? I don't know. It's a it's a complicated notion, but but I want to I want to point out, Jay. So again, pat yourself on the back. You have uh, a T. S. Eliot level. Um, objective correlative here as you have your person on the ledge seeing what happens with this family and this father and that the father is left behind with the, the, the mother takes the child and he's left with the freaking ball. Good job. Thank you. This. Do that and don't do the other thing. <laughs> Basically. Like, like don't you know, do the one great and don't do the other explaining thing. Right? Um, this, so then, humph, Rajan's smile turned into a grimace. Fine. That's his reaction. I'm fine with that. Um, but then this to the ground appeared closer and all the possibilities never do have come to da 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 da, crumpling on its edges. Too explicit. Right? what we want to do our objective our objective in total is to take the reader through experiences experiences that hurtle along that they feel things from i'm going to just say as a blanket for us all when we write when we start explaining what is happening however we do it we're basically condescending to the reader and we're into with their ability to experience the emotion. Just let them experience the emotion. That's it. 
and then hurdle them down the path willy-nilly till the end. Make them turn those pages. That's all we want to do. We're not trying to teach them anything. Um, anyway, nicely done. Um, uh, enjoyable work and very well done on the objective correlative. You can take that. You can check that off of your list of uh, fancy literary phrases you want to accomplish in your lifetime. Um, any questions? Uh, no. I mean, just a, just a large uh, statement, let's say. I mean, I, I felt this for the first time uh, a couple of weeks ago when my phone broke. So I looked around and everybody's looking at their phones. And to me, they all seemed like people who were sufficiently entertained and engaged with lives. While I was the one who was being bored to death because my phone's no longer working. Now, I've seen the same bunch of people looking into their phones day in, day out. It never occurred to me that they are having a better life or a more entertained life, so to speak, until my phone broke. So I began to see the same people having the same experience in a completely different light because I was no longer party to that experience. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Also, so um, I was going to say also, as I say to my daughters, when we compare, we despair. So. <laughs> um, I like uh, I like some of the comp make sure you in J in this piece, you do have like phone conversations. You have people who are there materially. Make sure you lead the reader very clearly through who's saying what and and the and the physical relationships of these things it's very hard i mean it's probably going to be more of a struggle for all modern writers basically because we have so many different ways of communicating to cover them all and we're getting basically sources of information it's very hard to organize all of that it's confusing on the page because writing is a very linear thing that can only deal with one thing at a time. So you're going to have to work hard to make sure that it's very clear. If he's talking to someone, he's talking on the phone with someone while he's talking on the phone with someone, he's also getting a text, you know, and he's getting a WhatsApp, you know, he's getting 50 WhatsApp, you know, things that are happening. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a complicated thing. So just, <clears throat> the um this is sort of like maybe a, a i don't know a conflict like we don't want to explain emotional circumstances to the readers readers are familiar with having emotions perceiving the perceiving the world around them and understanding what it means every single person on earth can do that however be very careful taking care of the readers um sense of clarity about what's happening there's no problem with being redundant, helping them along, making sure that they say, he said, he said, you know, so-and-so said over the phone. If we go to, actually, we'll just look at this for a second. Um, so like, this is a little place where like, you kind of end up jerking the reader around, you know, hello, the policeman's smile widened. Uh, you've met Naveen already, I presume. We don't know who's talking. Then he says, Vishnu, I'm like, what the hell you know just say hello this is vishnu vishnu what are you doing you know just be out with it you know like we don't need we don't need writing is complicated enough we don't need to add to it does that make sense so just try and be as clear you know you um in another workshop i was talking about risk to benefit ratio this is what we're dealing with unfortunately so we take a risk you're taking a risk by having him not know who's calling right away, having the person calling not say who he is. You know, you're taking a risk. What's the benefit? The benefit is marginal, I would say. I'd say the benefit is negative even. It's confusing. So it's a negative benefit for this action. So then we just change our action. As writers, we have infinite ability to change whatever we want. Just have him say, hey, this is Vishnu. Vishnu, I don't have time to talk right now. I'm talking to a police officer. Well, that police officer is a friend of mine. There we go. Very clear. 
Any, uh, Jay, any other questions? No. Oh, oh okay. My mic was No questions. Okay. Thank you, Jay. Uh, okay. We have uh, one more piece, I think. If, if anyone is uh, uh, Irvi here, am I saying that correctly? Yes, sir. Hi. What, uh, I don't see, uh, where are you? Oh. Yes, sir. Hey, how, how are you? I'm great, sir. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks. Uh, thanks for submitting this piece. Actually, last so, week I wasn't able to submit the piece. So I was determined to submit this piece. Okay. Um, the, um, so, uh, tell me a little bit about this piece. Uh, the, uh, I, this is a piece where I, uh, this is a story about a girl and how the things change when she, when she changes her perspective, as we discussed in the previous session that, uh, it must be in a narrative. It would be better if I uh, write in a narrative style rather than the straight mundane style of writing uh, like other theses and the other things are written so this time i tried creating a story through which uh, in the end i tried to uh, illustrate that the perspective is important while uh, judging a thing or choices of perspective is important in life yeah okay great i, I and i think you did a great job with that um Really, my my big I, I'm going to have you read a little bit of it. Um, but my big comment on this uh, story is basically to just let the story happen and don't explain it to us. Because like in this story, you you have the thing happen, right? You have the two situations, essentially, where the girl is, you know, she's forbidden from going out in the rain and it's like, oh, why? Why me? Right. And then you have the other situation where she's shopping. Are they on a motorcycle? Yes, what are sir. They? Oh, wow. I, okay. I, I was just searching for the word and at the moment I wasn't getting the perfect word for writing. Oh, okay. Yeah, I didn't know, like two wheeled. I ride, I ride a bike, bike, yes. bicycle a lot, bike. but I didn't know if it was like a two wheel bicycle at first or a cart with two wheels. You know, two wheels is like, yes. could be a lot of things. Um, well, that's uh, that's that's wild that it's on a on a motorcycle, but that's quite quite a great scene. I think it's the mother and the and and the daughter, daughter. right on the motorcycle where the daughter's holding the bags and the mom must be driving. So the daughter's job is basically to hold the bags. I love that scene. But what you what I, what I suggest you do is just um, let the let the story speak for itself. This is the thing. It's yes. like every you know we see that you know jay is explaining things to us you know every you know all these writers start explaining what's going on because it's just easier i guess right but we have to yeah. we have to trust our reader that if we do our work if we do our work well we don't have yeah. to explain anything so that's so I would just suggest trying to concentrate on doing your work well. You're basically juxtaposing, putting these two different um, scenes together. And I would just concentrate on doing that well so that, yes. and again, with the objective correlative, you do that so nicely here, you also have an objective correlative. So she's looking out the window and she sees the kids were already with their paper boats. And I want to see that image even more so like they're making paper yeah. boats and what putting them in the gutter as it, as the rain is running down. I want to see yeah. that. Yes, sir. Um, the other thing that I'm going to uh, ask you to do is um, pay attention to uh, the formatting a little bit because it can really help us when we write. I know it can seem it like, is. oh my God, I just have to learn this, but it's actually it's not really learning format. It's actually using it to our benefit. So like you want to indent for new paragraphs, right? 
so that we know that we have new paragraphs and we want to have paragraphs. I'm going to maybe change my color. We want to have paragraphs that are all about one thing. And when we change to something else, a paragraph should be one idea. And when we write it, when we change to another idea, have a new paragraph that will help us. Yes. <laughs> I would just only try to add it in my writing. Yeah. Because so, I'm confused but, with editing and formatting according to creating paragraph is a difficult thing for me. I think. Yeah, totally. But if you start thinking about it a little bit, what happens actually, if you start thinking about like having paragraphs and you think about your writing, they actually sort of meet in the middle and you start to write a little bit in a more organized fashion, you start writing basically as paragraphs. It's weird, but that's sort of what I end up doing. I, I basically think, I think in paragraphs. And so I write in paragraphs. It does, don't worry that it doesn't happen completely now and it can be a little bit difficult, but over time, it will start to come together. So really what we're doing now and actually in through our entire lives is just practicing. So we just keep typing, we keep writing, we keep trying to see the world and we keep trying to write it down. That's it. And then yeah. we add these little things. Um, let's, uh, can, um, can I have you read just a short section of this? Yes. I'm going to, I'm going to have you read actually just this, this section here. So do you see the part that I have the green around? Uh, yes, I am able to. Okay, yeah, if you could read that part and then ending with that objective correlative, the boats, you know, that are floating. Yes. Jia went to the balcony and stood there gazing at the rain. She was upset because of denial of permission. She wanted to dance and enjoy the rain truly, but she needed to accept the fact and stood there half-heartedly. She went away to the kitchen with a sparkle in her eye she came back with a steaming cup of coffee and said to herself, if not rains, I can at least enjoy gazing at it. Peter patter of raindrops and a fresh fragrance of soil made the environment wonderful. And it was also brimming with excitement because all her apartment's kids were ready with, her paper, with their paper boats. Okay, fantastic. That's a great, it's a great image. I like the action. I. I thought she was too young to drink coffee, but that maybe is my own problem. Is it caffeinated? I hope not. I don't, I don't let my daughter drink caffeinated coffee. So, but she does, she does <laughs> love getting Starbucks. If I, what is that a product placement? Okay. I, I, I expect some kickback from that. Another little thing to take away <clears throat> is, you know, like the two wheeled, like the two wheeled vehicle. I yes. can't see, you know, that's not exact enough for me to understand what it is. Yes. And this is something I was also <clears throat> saying to Aditi all, before that when we have things that are vague, it's less, yes. it doesn't evoke as much. So like the store arranged everything, nearby store, many bags, uh, living creatures, uh, vehicle, you know, um, heavy bag of essentials. It's much better to be exact. And like you, I can tell that in this piece that you know exactly where you're writing about, right? You're thinking of an exact store. Yes. Write that exact store. Write those exact things that they take off the shelves, do, do the shopping, this, that, all of those things be our words right that will evoke something in your reader's mind that are going to be interesting and basically make the movie go off in our head that's what we want we want the reader to have a little movie going in their head when you write so like i said to aditi right earlier i said if we close our eyes and we say the crowd rushed the fence and i used to have i used to have workshops i would have everyone close their eyes and i would say those words and i would say tell me what you saw. And they would say, I saw nothing. Right. But when you say, when you say, um, the crowd, uh, surged and pushed a small boy 
against the fence, his face turned against the metal grating, um, his glasses askew or whatever. When we start dealing with specific detail, then we can start to see, then the reader starts to see in their mind. I know that you already see it, right? Because you yes. know the store, you know the store, you know what they bought, you know those exact things. You have to use the words for those things, put them on the page so that I can see them. Yes. Right? Does that make some sense? Yes, yeah, surely. I, I would. Yeah, so I think that this is great. I would love to see this piece again. Yeah, sure. After if I you want to work on it. it. Yes, sure. Yeah. Or write something new either way. Oh, yes. I will surely try to edit it and also create some new ideas. Great. Awesome. Well, thank you for submitting it. Thank you for the feedback. Yeah. Um, I think that that, um, I think that those are the pieces. Does anyone feel like I've missed something? Cause I can feel like I missed something, but I think that that's it. I think we're, those are the four pieces that I have. Uh, Jay resubmitted his piece. I did have that on the docket from before, but he did resubmit. So we talked about that piece. Albanov? I don't think so. I think from last week, there were three pieces that were pending and I think you have gone through those. So we should be good. Uh, there is, uh, yeah, and, and I think, uh, as you said, we won't be having the session next Sunday on the 10th. And most likely we'll not have it on the 17th. So unless and until uh, you hear from me, we will meet again on the 24th then. So, you know, that uh, intervening two week period should give everyone enough time to send in more pieces. I know mine, uh, one from, I have to send mine. It's been pending for a long, long time. Actually, I have at least two pieces <laughs> that are pending from my side. So. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. And um, uh, it's uh, been so much fun. And um, next weekend, I have a, a plan for the weekend. So I'll be out and then I guess Abhinav uh, might be out the next weekend. So that'll give us two weeks off. Um, but so take the two weeks, get some writing done. Let's stack up some work. And um, yeah, let's, uh, let's get a lot of writing done this fall. Fall is a great time to do writing as you know, the, our, our, our last author mentioned, you know, we just, you know, it's a little bit cold. We have a nice warm cup of coffee and there's, as, as they say, um, coffee makes writing. And no, that's not what they say, but it's something like that. You can't go wrong with coffee. I mean, that's the bottom line. Yes. <laughs> yes, all right. Well, thank you. And let's all keep dreaming of our trip in the Himalayas with Rohini. Yes, let's do that. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you.